Okay. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on which time zone you are in. So I will be talking about multimodality in vision, audition, and touch. And uh, uh, let me uh, start it off by stating some context. Uh, so uh, at least in my mind, uh, a very plausible way to think about how to build intelligence in machines is to look at the process of the development of intelligence in uh, children. And I call this the Turing's baby project because Turing in his 1950 paper, uh, and I've included an excerpt from this, had this basic idea of instead of trying to produce a program to simulate the adult mind, why not rather try to produce one which simulates the child's? If this were then subjected to an appropriate course of education, one would obtain the adult brain. And uh, this is 1950, and of course, in the last 70 years, we have learned a lot about how children uh, grow up and how they learn and so forth. But very important in there is this, this early stage of multimodal interaction. So you think about this baby in the crib. Uh, she's trying to touch this object. She sees the object. She rattles it, so therefore she hears the sound. So it's touch sound, vision, maybe even uh, taste. I mean, they try to put various objects in their mouth. And it's this combination which makes them uh, such efficient learners. And uh, we, are, we are still far off from the capability of a two-year-old. So, uh, uh, but if you take this approach seriously, uh, one way to think about it is that we have the whole, uh, we have this, literature in child development on the how, how embodied uh, cognition emerges. And uh, the basic thesis is that intelligence emerges in the interaction of an agent with an environment and as a result of sensory motor activity. Now, uh, let's look at uh, what uh, concretely. And uh, this is uh, work from Smith and Gasser, but what they are summarizing is general insights and beliefs of many people in the child development community. So the first aspect of that is being multimodal. And uh, then it's being incremental. So you some kind of curriculum learning, physical, actually interacting with the world, exploring it, social and language. So I'm going to take, in this talk, the focus is on multimodality. So I'm going to start with one uh, very a straightforward case of multimodal learning, which is, this is work we call audiovisual slow fast networks. And this is with some colleagues at Facebook research. And this is available on archive. Fanny Xiao, Yong Jie Li, Kristen Grauman, myself, and Christoph Eichendorfer. So uh, audiovisual learning. So here uh, we know uh, from a lot of work in uh, psycho psychophysics and neuroscience that visual and audio signals are combined in the brain. And for this, I'm going to give you a demo of the so-called McGurk effect. Some of you have probably seen it, but for the benefit of others, this is quite fun. Okay, so the, this is something that many of you have already seen demos of, but uh, here, what I'm going to talk about is how we exploit the combination of vision and audio for uh, recognizing activity. So we have this work called the slow fast uh, network for understanding video, uh, video. And this is kind of the leading backbone for, uh, for activity recognition. And this was published at last ICCV and even at this ICCV all the leading entries in the activity net competition they used, made use of this slow fast network. And the slow fast network was originally invented purely to deal with uh, video signals and uh, not making use of sound. So the basic idea, let me recap for those of you who don't know the slow fast network, is to have two pathways. And in this diagram, if you look on the right, there's a top pathway, which is the slow pathway and the slow pathway is high resolution, okay? So this is essentially looking at the signal. So this is obviously some kind of a party scene, and but it's looking at all the frames at say one hertz. 
And now this signal is analyzed with uh, lots of channels and lots of spatial resolution. And this is the slow pathway. So in the middle row, you see what we call the fast pathway. And here the idea is that you have a high frame rate, but you have a lower channel uh, number of channels. So the idea is that you need relatively few features to encode the purely temporal signal. So this is this kind of signal that would be encoded by optical flow. And here this woman is dancing. So the movement, very smooth movement, which you get if you're looking at the signal at 30 hertz. And these two pathways, and uh, what we show is we combine the signal from them. So the signal from the fast pathway, it's not late fusion. The signal is being combined all the way and the signal is being transmitted from one to the other, and uh, then uh, we are training it end to end. And this system is the, the leader for approaches on uh, data sets like AVA or various activity net challenges. Uh, uh, okay, so now the question is, suppose we also have sounds. So we know that sounds accompanying actions should help in the, our ability to recognize the sounds. So, so that's the audio signal. So imagine that you see a car driving or somebody clapping. Then if you had access to that signal, right, the, the clapping signal, then that would give you, that sound would help you with respect to the recognition of what is happening. So we have essentially augmented the slow fast network with an audio pathway. And we, in fact, think of it as the faster pathway because essentially the audio signal, you want to sample it at even, at even faster than video, right? So video you're doing at a 30 hertz, but obviously you want to sample the audio signal much faster. And uh, so that's what is indicated here by that elongation in the, the channel. And, uh, and then we combine it with the rest of the pathways, the slow pathway and the fast pathways. And the combination is again at various stages. It's not just at, in the late fusion sense. And, uh, and that's it. And that's the basic idea. And we can now use, uh, see how, how much this improves our performance at tasks like uh, activity classification. But there are some subtleties, and these are subtleties which have been noticed by people before, who when they try to combine audio and visual signals, it, these are like practical nitty gritty problems which, uh, which are annoying and which make life a bit difficult. And uh, that's shown here by the, the learning process, right? So you see on the y-axis the error and the x-axis is the e epoch. And what you see is that the audio network trains quite fast. Right, there is less data; it trains very quickly. Whereas the 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 visual signal takes a long time; it's more complex and so forth. So what happens is that when we just train it in a vanilla way, what will happen is that the audio will start to overfit while the visual network has not yet got trained. So we need some tricks for this, and a couple of different tricks have been invented. But the one that we used was the we essentially slowed down the training of the audio pathway. And we did this by randomly dropping the audio pathway with probability P to slow it down. So like 80% of the dropping rate. So it's similar to the dropout idea, but it's being done with respect to the whole queue. And, uh, and this technique helps us out. And, uh, and then the net result is that we have in, we improve our uh, or uh, recognition performance and the details you can find in the paper. But uh, I mean, this is a demo on the right that you see. So the person here, you have this video clip. I mean, these are video clips taken from movies. Uh, this is Eva. And uh, you're classifying every individual in terms of what action they are performing. So uh, what you're seeing here are the tags, uh, stand, carry object, talk to person, watch person, and so forth. And uh, obviously the audio signal here contributes to, to doing a good job. I should mention here, and this I will not get into too much detail, but you can look up in the archive paper, that there is a self-supervised story here as well. So uh, we are trying to so use the, 
the coordination between the audio and the visual signal. And this is actually one of the nice magical properties of multimodal learning, that in a sense, you can reduce the need for supervision because the two modalities can cross supervise each other. So the audio can supervise the video, the video can supervise the audio. So the spirit here in, is the following, that we have this visual signal, which is in the top two rows, uh, and then there's an audio signal, and either the audio signal is aligned with it, with it, meaning that it's in sync with it, or it's out of sync. So we have shifted it by some amount. And what the network has to do is to learn which, which, which of these things is it. Is the audio sync in sync, or then it says yes, otherwise it says no. And this becomes uh, the proxy task for doing uh, self-supervised learning. And, uh, and uh, the nice thing is that this really works and, uh, and this enables us to do uh, quite good a job at self-supervised representation learning. So, uh, uh, so let me uh, stop here because what I'm going to do is uh, to get to, uh, to use a, to change my screen share. Let's see. Ah, sorry, I'm just trying to get the other slide deck. No worries, please uh, take your time. Okay, now uh, what do people see? Do you, they see multi-modality in vision, audition, and touch? Correct. And learning individual styles of conversation? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so now I'm going to get into multi-modality in a, in, a, in a different setting. So this is in the setting of conversational gesture. Okay, and this is work which was presented at last CVPR. Okay. So, uh, so here are lots of famous computer vision scientists and researchers. And this is in fact a recording from a previous workshop on multimodal. And uh, I've turned off the audio, but what you can see is every person in this crowd, they have their characteristic gestures. Okay, so uh, uh, you, okay, so, so basically we can't help it. When we talk, we emit sounds, but we are simultaneously emitting, emitting gestures with our hands. And what we want to do is to make sense of this. That's the theme of this, this work. So uh, this is a topic which has been studied a lot, in, uh, particularly in linguistics, and they have distinguished between different kinds of gesture accompanying speech. So iconic, metaphoric, beat, didactic, cohesive, emblematic. Let me give you examples. So, uh, so uh, Kenden, Adam Kenden, who is one of the linguists who's worked on this, he describes this as a continuum, where at one end you have uh, what's very much like language, and on the other end, uh, which is like fully developed, like an alternative to language, which is what sign language is, and at the other end you have gesture, which is which accompanies speech. It is not a substitute for speech; it accompanies speech and add some extra layers of meaning here. So, uh, so let's start with one end of the spectrum, which is sign language. Mandela taught us the power of action, but he also taught us the power of ideas. So here, uh, what you see on the left and right is exactly the same signal in some form. It's just that uh, sign language is a little bit like English versus French, so you have another language, which is ASL, and it's processed by the same parts of the brain. Uh, okay, then we have what is often called Italianate gesture. What? 
come on, full of people. So this is, uh, uh, well, it's called Italianate because it is claimed that Italians use it more often. But basically, you can think of it as it's, it's very uh, stereotyped. It's a shared language, but it's at the level of words. So particular words or phrases are, have equivalents in your gesture. And uh, uh, here are some references to the kind of work which has been done in psychology. There's been work done in uh, sort of in AI and multimedia, and uh, uh, there's been some work in can trying to go from sound to video, and that's more the theme of uh, the work that I talk about. So the problem that we will consider is the one of predicting gesture from speech. So, so the gesture accompanies the speech and it helps reinforce the points being made in the speech, and it's very it is very personal. So my gesture is different from your gesture is from someone else's gesture. So what we want to do is to train individual models here. And our goal will be, can we predict the style of a person, the gesture style of a person? So if I have the audio track, I can generate the associated gesture. Texas Congressman Mike Conaway questioned how the FBI so that's what our system does. It has this audio signal and then it's producing this. And, uh, uh, and here are, and this is a little flavor of the data set. So we have 10 different subjects, uh, 128 hours total. This is available for people to work on. And uh, these are like talk show hosts or professors or uh, religious preachers or whatever. And the problem we are going to handle is we are not going to try to predict pixels. What we're going to try to predict is the state of the body. So we're going to try to predict it in, at the level of pose. So where, are, where is uh, the arm, the hands, et cetera, et cetera. Waiting outside. Why are you telling me all this? And you're not going to believe what they said they wanted to. Isn't that disgusting? It's 2012. We're still not on the and then report it to the police. <laughs> Even Lauer's conversation, slight, more photons per second, still none of the... So this gives you a flavor of the data that we have. So we have lots of speakers with their gestures, and then the gestures have been annotated with these key points. So that's the space in which we will try to work. Audio plus gesture. So how do gesture styles differ across speakers? So we'll try to predict gestures from the audio. So we do the usual analysis from audio and we are going to try to predict pose. And uh, yeah, so the audio so input. So Nordberg is a murderer. So, you know, try and separate the two. Now, now the good news is, these days, very few people will say they are completely anti-vaccine. Instead, like the president. So what we do is we predict the gestures and we put in the face. So Nordberg is a murderer. So, you know, try and separate the two. And then we can now, try to synthesize the, the video. The good news is, these days, very few people will say they are completely anti-vaccine. Instead, like the president. <laughs> Excuse me. So some more, uh, so more details on the method, audio, push through a network, and then you try to synthesize these frames. And then from those, we try to synthesize the, so, so for this synthesis, uh, important thing is one is at training time, you need to have two kinds of losses. One loss is that, uh, that your try regression loss, but this by itself doesn't work as well. It doesn't necessarily generate real uh, signals, the usual problem that you get uh, regression to the mean, you get averages of various signals. So what you do is we add a, a like a GAN type stage, a discriminator, where which is trying to discriminate, is it a real or fake motion sequence? And then for synthesis, we use this Chan et al. technique, everybody dance now. So, uh, so the, uh, so, these so are, you know, try and separate the two. Now, now the good. 
So the thing is, when you don't have this, uh, so this GAN is trying to say, is it discriminative of that person? So without the GAN, what you get is the, the problem is that it basically looks very generic and bland and boring. It's more like the average case. ...of doctors. But, but, but even though Wakefields can... Okay, so here are some examples. Mr. Nordberg is a murderer. So, you know, try and separate the two. Now, now the good news is, these days, very few people will say they are completely anti-vaccine. Instead, like the president. So, you, yeah, if you look at his body and you can see the quality of the synthesis. So you can stop and see, yeah, there's like something wrong here, right? The fingers are not quite right, but it's still a pretty good, I think. So then... Mr. Again. Nordberg is a murderer, so, you know, try and separate the two. Now, now the good news is, these days, very few people will say they are completely anti-vaccine. Instead, like the president. Helping and protecting the... Finding no link between thimerosal and autism. And okay, so then here are some numbers which, uh, with various... Uh, uh, yeah, PCK. So PCK is a measure for predicting how good you predicted the key points. So the all the the shoulder, the elbow, etc. And you can uh, what we judge is did you predict the correct location of the key point? And uh, PCK is what fraction of them are within the uh, correct threshold or where are close enough. And basically, here are the results of that, which show that this technique is doing a reasonable job. And here are prediction examples for other speakers. Talking about the instantaneous rate, the rate just when the concentration is. Energy to boil. Higher kinetic energy, higher temperature. So note, by the way, that we are just using the audio signal and no semantics. So something like higher and lower, if we had speech recognition on the audio track, then presumably that could give us additional juice. And that, uh, I think we, we would love to show that. I can't believe we're letting America see our logo in order to make it more modern. Yeah. Yeah, appropriate noise for that. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, and this is uh, this is a, a confusion matrix which shows you that gestures are very person specific. So you can't take one person model and apply it up to another person. Then the error rates are pretty high. So you when we go into the business of making avatars, it has to be done individually. And uh, this is what happens if you try to <coughs> transfer, I mean. Uh, HD video frames, so full video sequences, and we have ground truth for all tasks on every single frame at video rate. And we have ground truth for both low level and high level vision tasks. So low level tasks like optical flow, visual odometry, object boundaries, high level tasks like semantic segmentation, semantic instance segmentation, 3D scene. Like anyway, you get the flavor, but uh, so this is of course from last year. So I don't think you should go to this poster right now. Uh, 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 so this is the work of Shiri Jinosar and uh, with this website you can get as much detail if, as you want. You want to download the data set, develop your own models, it's all available. Uh, I want to uh, make some general remarks about social perception because social perception is multimodal. And uh, a few things to state there are that computers today are very bad at this. We need to understand the internal state of humans as they interact with each other. And that means emotional state, body language, current goals. And right now we are capturing far too little of it. So we have technology which is able to do speech recognition. We have technology which is able to now find pose of people. But really we want to think of all of this together. 
Okay, in my the last part of my talk, I'm going to uh, take a different uh, track. And the, this is about vision and touch. So, so far we were doing vision in audio and by and large, when you go to any multimedia conference or a computer vision conference, when people say multimodal, they usually mean vision and audio. But I think very important is vision and touch. And this is, uh, and I'm gonna describe some work, which is uh, just, very recent, it's uh, the archive paper should show up in a week or two. Uh, and this is uh, work led by uh, Edward Smith. And uh, this is about 3D shape reconstruction from vision and touch. And a lot of this was done at Facebook research. Touch, why touch? Okay, so, uh, so we have touch in our hands, right? Our fingers are full of, uh, uh, the skin has, underneath the skin, there are a lot of sensors. And what they enable us to do is to get a very good sense of the local structure. So, uh, and we have a variety of different uh, mechanoreceptors there. Once the ones which can detect uh, low frequencies, others which can de detect high frequencies, pressure, heat, cold, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the problem is that the state of the art in touch sensing is far, far behind the state of the art in visual sensing and audio sensing. So audio sensing, okay, we have microphones. We have had microphones forever. Okay, uh, visual sensing, uh, it used to be a challenge like in the say 70s, 80s, but since then we have digital cameras and zillions of people are taking pictures, uploading them on the web. And the resolution of the best cameras today, like the one in your iPhone, is really very good. I, I mean, it's comparable to foveal resolution itself. So uh, it's uh, so we 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 are good. We are in good space for space for vision and audio. What about touch? Can I just get off the shelf uh, touch sensor which is as good as the human, uh, you know, fingers? Uh, the answer is no. I mean, there is now some work, and this is there is a, one of the leading examples is work from MIT in Ted Edelson's group, it's called gel sight. And very cleverly what they do is they convert uh, touch into vision. So there is some kind of rubbery material uh, and uh, gel-like material. And in that material, underneath you have some uh, lighting and cameras. And when that, there's a mechanical uh, perturbation that causes some change in the surface shape, which can be sensed by the, the change in appearance and that you can do with cameras. So I'm not gonna go into details, it's called gel sight. And then there are later evolutions of building out on this idea. So what's the problem we want to tackle? So the problem we want to tackle is like the problem that this baby uh, uh, solves, right? So this baby is touching this, these objects and it's seeing these objects. Right? And of course, there's also sound and possibly taste and so forth, but let's focus on vision and touch for now. And these together provide the signal for manipulation. And notice how vision and touch are complementary. So when the object is far away, I can see the object, I, I can't touch it. Okay, fine. I plan my grasp, I plan how I'm going to reach out towards that object. When I have grabbed the object, when I've grasped the object, my vision signal is now occluded, right? The object is hidden by my hand. So the fact is that because of that occlusion, my estimate of the shape of this object is going to degrade. I no longer can see the object properly because it's occluded by my hand. However, at this time, uh, the touch signal kicks in because I'm holding the object in my hand. So in my fingers and in my palm, there are all these receptors which are detecting the local sort of uh, shape, if you will. So what we want to do is to combine these two signals. So we want to combine the signal from vision and combine the signal from touch. And hopefully this uh, builds it out again, and then we can use this information for manipulation. When I'm manipulating an object, then uh, my vision signal is visual signal is degraded because of occlusion, but the touch signal is going to guide me. And 
amazingly, this area is just so, so under-researched, mainly because I think uh, the availability of uh, good sensing uh, technology. And as that gets to be there, we are going to do a better job. I think in my mind, in fact, this is one of the major reasons why robotic research has not taken off as much as we would like. If you think about cameras, cameras 40 years ago versus cameras now, they're just a world apart. At that point, you had, uh, you had to scan in photographs and so on and look at the resolution of cameras now, the one which is there in your cell phone, which probably costs like less than a dollar. Think about uh, the end effectors which are being used in robotics. They used to use parallel jaw grippers in the 1980s, and they're still using parallel jaw grippers. And uh, so this is two issues. One issue is actuation, so multi-finger actuation hand, and the other issue is sensing of touch. Okay, so with this background, let me tell you what uh, we did. So we tried to solve this problem of how do we recover shape when you have a combination of a vision signal and a touch signal. So you imagine, so this is done in simulation, but we actually have real hardware on which we can do this too, and that will follow. So imagine that there is this object like this bottle, and you have a hand, a multi-fingered hand, and on the tips of the fingers, you have tactile sensing. And now what you do is you can see the object and you can guess its shape, right? So there are computer vision techniques which will do that for you. Now what we do is we, uh, we touch the object, right? We grasp it or something. It's just natural in the course of manipulation. So what will happen is that the visual signal is now got degraded. Okay, but there is still some visual signal which we can try to use. It's occluded visual signal. But then there's also the touch signal, which is that at the tips of these four fingers, okay, each of them, you're going to get a signal. And then the signal in the case of gel site is like a local image, which captures the local distribution of pressure. And the touch signal here is shown uh, by these, uh, this, uh, these four squares. And those four squares correspond to the four, uh, the signal from the four uh, fingers. And each of those squares it is itself a little pixel grid. So, uh, so when we're doing this in simulation, we load a hand into the scene, we load an object to the scene, you move the hand to the surface, you grasp the object. Now, uh, now uh, let's see what what's the what's the signal that. Uh, so let's think about what are, what are the cues to shape available for this. So there's obviously the vision signal. There's obviously the touch signal. But note that there is one more source of information from the, the fingers, which is that uh, I know my own morphology and my own kinematics. So if I, the robot, I know that, right? So therefore I know by working out the inverse kinematics, I know where each of the fingertips is in Euclidean space. So in Euclidean space, I can say that the thumb is at location 27, comma 15, comma, 36, and we may even know the, the, the orientation of the thumb, right? Because I commanded the movement of the hand. So therefore, for each of the four fingers, you in fact have a signal of absolute space, where in absolute 3D space is that location. And since we are grasping the bottle, we know that it's at a certain position in, uh, on the bottle. So and so that's that's like the the absolute positioning in space and then there is the signal which is going to come from the little touch pad which is going to tell me something uh, which is going to be like a little array of tactiles tactile elements which is going to uh, give me some uh, local information about surface normals curvature etc cetera, etc cetera. it's going to be quite fine grained but local and then there's going to be the visual signal so at some level, you have to think about this as having three signals, uh, vision, uh, the gross positioning of the fingers around the object, and the delicate touch signal, which is high res, but very local. So just to summarize, we have uh, so these uh, different objects. Uh, so there's this bottle, and then below it, you see the bottle, but occluded because of the fingers. And uh, then there's the touch signal. 
and then there's the object surface with the touch sites highlighted. Uh, similarly, in the, the bottom, you have this knife, uh, the occluded knife, because you're holding it in your hand, and then the touch signals at the four locations. Uh, okay. So, uh, so what we need is a, a neural network architecture for combining this. Uh, basically, the, the visual signal will give you the global context and then you'll fuse it with the local signal from the touch signal. And then we predict object surface. And uh, here are some results. So the touch signal, the predicted depth, local points. So the way it's done is that you, you try to predict charts. So chart is this terminology from differential geometry. So sort of the local shape of the surface. So that's, uh, we use the term atlas of charts in differential geometry. So each finger location is giving you a chart and then there is charts corresponding to the visual signal. And then all of these have to be consistent with each other, right? So the signal from multiple charts have, uh, at their overlap has to align and that has to be taken into account in the processing. So, uh, so with this uh, big picture, so there's a vision signal which gives rise to image features, which give rise to these vision charts the touch signal gives you local information, which are at all the fingers. So those are the touch charts. Then the charts are deformed so as to bring them all into alignment. And then finally we get the global prediction. And uh, then the table below shows sort of the results. And uh, we can consider two settings. One is uh, occluded and not occluded. And here, larger numbers means more error. So this is like an error signal. So if you do a touch only system is not so accurate, the error is the highest there. Vision gives you more information because it gives you information about the whole object. But if you consider the unoccluded vision, so unoccluded vision with touch is the best. So that's the lowest error. Uh, when you have uh, occluded vision, which is on the left, so that's the practical case that we have to worry about. So uh, if, there, if you are using the signal from touch, Okay, the, the, the error is reduced compared to using the signal from no touch, right? So no touch means that you're not using the signal from touch. So 0.991 relative to 1.074. So that's the, the, the value that, that we are getting additional signal from uh, the touch, which prevents us from losing all the information we would have if uh, uh, we didn't have that. Now, of course, what remains to be shown is that how this helps with uh, manipulation tasks, but uh, at least we can show the reconstruction part of the problem uh, is, is, uh, can be handled quite nicely. And uh, here you see the benefit of uh, uh, multiple grasps and uh, multiple uh, and the visual signal for different shapes. Okay, so I think uh, with that, I'm going to end. I think I've ended early because I wanted to leave time for questions. And what I've shown you are, uh, is first the big philosophy that uh, multimodality is a characteristic of children's developmental uh, process. And they have signals from vision, audition, touch, even uh, taste from their mouth uh, and so forth. These uh, signals are all, and then in adulthood as well, we use all these signals. At the childhood stage, these signals can in fact provide cross supervision for each other. And uh, I think it's uh, time for the community to pay a lot more attention to it than we have been doing. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, uh, Jitendra, for the great talk. Uh, very interesting paper. So uh, folks, uh, questions? Feel free to unmute. Um, Bodo, do we have people on mute or can they unmute themselves? I think uh, participants can unmute themselves. Okay, so feel free to unmute yourself and uh, ask questions.
maybe maybe I ask a question. So I'm Bodo Rosenhan from Hannover. So um, many years ago, I listened to one of your talks and I always enjoyed them. So it was really a pleasure to listen to you again. And then you talked about, about the three R's of computer vision, reconstruction, recognition, and reorganization. Uh, so what do you think about this aspect of reorganization nowadays? Okay, so uh, yes, so I think uh, I still believe in them. I think uh, what's happened in, in computer vision as a whole is that reorganization and recognition, I, they have got folded together. So when you have the output of a system like mask RCNN, so what does mask RCNN doing? The mask RCNN is detecting an object like a chair or a bottle, and then it marks the pixels corresponding to that object. So that's the, the reorganization part or the segmentation or grouping part. So I think that in a sense, we have had success. We, have, we are able to do this. Uh, is, the, is the story done? Is it complete? I would say no. And the reason is that we are currently uh, too much in the paradigm of uh, just being able to recognize and process images or objects which we have learned. So in old style computer vision, 20 years ago, we had techniques which were generic in nature, which worked for any object, even if I had never seen it before, right? The techniques we have now, they're learning techniques, so they rely on having seen that object before. So I have lots of examples of chairs and tables and bottles, and with that, I build a model which, model which can detect the object and segment it out. But what if there is some new animal, I'm in Africa and I see an okapi and I've never seen an okapi before. I still am able to segment it out. And I think this category agnostic uh, uh, grouping or category agnostic reorganization to use my terminology, I think that is a, is a neglected area. I think we need to show that. And we are going to need more and more of it because What's happening is that our supervised approaches are running out of steam because we have the, the categories for which we have lots of examples, we can do a good job. But categories for which we don't have few examples, we are in trouble. And there's always this very long tail of categories for which we don't have any examples. And we need to develop techniques for that. In the context of the multimodal work that I described, I think the three R's are all relevant for each of those R's. So the bottle example that I showed you was one of, uh, of uh, reconstruction using multiple cues, vision and touch. The very first example that I did was about audio visual so fast, but that's an example of audio and visual together for recognition. But uh, good question, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the answer. And, and maybe I can add another one. So. Newborns ha have a phase where they always place their objects in the mouth. It's called the oral phase. Yes. So do you think it's something like a 3D haptic sensor or how would you interpret that? I, I would guess that it is a little bit like a haptic sensor. Yeah, because the mouth is a measure of, uh, of uh, uh, it, it, I mean, they would know from that the size of objects, et cetera, et cetera. And in a certain way, the mouth functions like a hand for many animals. So if you think of a, a you know, a, like a lion or a tiger hunting, then they, they use the mouth as kind of, as, as like an equivalent of a hand, right? It's used in, as part of capturing a prey, et cetera, et cetera. So the mouth is in fact, in some ways, kind of like a hand. The human hand has become much more sophisticated because of the opposable thumb and so forth. So it has much more articulation and many more degrees of freedom, which enable us to do much more sophisticated tool use. But you can think of the mouth as having, the mouth is a manipulated manipulation organ. Yes, thanks. Um, I have a question, is it possible we have time? Yes, my uh, Okay. Okay. Uh, hello, Jitendra. This is Vittorio. Hi, Vittorio. Uh, nice talk. Thank you. And um, I'd like to ask you a question about your first um, um, presentation about audiovisual. 
Um, so far, now there is a, a lot of uh, works now about uh, how to integrate uh, um, so audio modality, especially single microphones. Um, so there are something in stereo recently, um, but what, which is the, the frontier for you about the use of multiple microphones to, in a way, capture in a more let's say, accurate and sharp way the sounds in an environment. So do you think there is a room uh, for, uh, in a way, improving our models uh, to, in a way, scene understanding in, uh, in general? Or yes. What are your thoughts in, in this? Uh, yeah. yeah, no, 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 I, I am a fan of this. Uh, I think that uh, this kind of audio scene understanding or audio visual scene understanding really requires using binaural system. So I need to have two sources of uh, two microphones. And it's just that uh, there's been very little work on it. And again, it's just because of the ready availability of hardware, right? So I think many more people would have been working on it if there was these binaural two microphone systems which were readily available. So just like I said in my last part about touch, I think touch is a very important sense. I think it's, there are easy wins there. I mean, there's lots of stuff to be done, which is just straightforward, which hasn't been done. And it's, we are being held up because those, cameras, those sensors are not so readily available as cameras. I think that, uh, so simply when your microphone systems are more readily available, we'll see a lot more research. Now, there are people who have done in very nice work in that space. Uh, Kristen Grauman's work is an example. She has done a fair number of paper, a couple of papers which are on this spatialized, uh, spatially localized sound. And there is work in this area which shows up in SIGGRAPH and so forth. But I think this should grow. This is an important area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know the, the work of Kristen. Yeah, yeah, very nice. Uh, yeah, thank you. And uh, y yes, you think that uh, in, in a sense uh, is, uh, there is a barrier so far with actually the technological of the sensory devices we use. For example, for touch, we don't have the same facility as the cameras. And microphones are a little bit better, but uh, not, not that much, essentially. So. Yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you, Jitain. Yeah, yeah, we should use this because if you think about robots, right? So the robotics people have gone quite a bit in the direction of LIDAR and so forth, right? For self-driving yeah. cars. But they have neglected these other modalities. I mean, they should be using sound as a signal. They should be using touch as a signal. And whereas yeah. they have they've gone in the direction of RGBD, which is good, which is also useful. But I'm saying that they have, in my mind, they have somewhat neglected the sound signal as well as the touch signal. So I, I have the same thoughts actually, because uh, to me, if you want to really deploy a, 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 an understanding system, an intelligent system in the real world, uh, we need uh, multiple modalities as much as we can. So we think ourselves, we, we as humans, we are in a way moving uh, by listening, by looking, by, you know, by touching. So I think we, we need more sensory data and to integrate the sensory data in a, in a way, proper models to, to make it, uh, in a way, fruitful altogether. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Great. Uh, thanks, uh, Jitendra, for the great talk and uh, everyone for the questions that uh, you have asked. I think this concludes our second session of the workshop. <clears throat> I think we'll be back after a short break uh, in the same Zoom link. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Goodbye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Okay, so workshop will start again at, I believe, 2.50, 2.50 p.m. Uh, PDT, Seattle time. Till then, uh, this is a break for uh, lunch.
Hello, my name is Vladimir and I'm from Tampa University. I am going to present our work called Multimodal Dense Video Captioning. This is joint work with S. Arahtu. Video understanding is a challenging and essential task in computer vision. It has a broad range of applications such as content-based retrieval and recommendation, autonomous driving, surveillance, software for the devices for visually impaired people, which would allow them to understand the media content better. There are plenty of approaches to tackle video understanding, for example, action recognition, content summarization, action anticipation, video question answering, and video captioning, and many other tasks, of course. In this work, we are going to focus on video captioning. The task of video captioning requires a model to generate one sentence or one paragraph description of the video content. However, it's difficult to think up one sentence which might thoroughly describe a 19-minute movie. To this end, it was proposed to first localize the events on the video and then to generate a caption for each of the events. This problem is called dense video captioning. Let's step back a bit and think how a healthy human perceives video content. Typically, they employ information from several modalities into consideration. Specifically, we are using our eyes to see the visual content and ears to hear the audio. For example, this video clip. Since the person is wearing a hat and huge sunglasses, it might be quite challenging to guess that this is a lady, especially for a computer vision model. However, when we hear the audio, we might guess that this is likely a lady. Snowboarding for young kids, especially the under sixes, has become very accessible in recent years. Moreover, a video often contains a dialogue. Sometimes the dialogue is not clear or the person is not proficient in a foreign language to comprehend the conveyed idea. To address this, the person might turn on subtitles. Therefore, it is natural to assume that a video understanding approach might benefit from utilizing multiple modalities. Yet the majority of work on dense video captioning uses only visual features, ignoring the other two. To this end, we propose a multimodal dense video captioning module. The model inputs the features from audio, visual, and speech modalities, as well as the previous sequence of caption words. It processes the inputs in the corresponding encoder-decoder blocks. All three outputs are then fused in the multimodal generator, which models the distribution for the next caption word. Note that our model is not limited to three modalities and can handle any number of them. As an encoder-decoder architecture, we select the transformer because it's not recurrent and therefore efficiently scalable and can catch long-term dependencies. It was initially proposed for machine translation. We will briefly describe the concept of feature transformer for the visual sequence. The features from visual frames are extracted using the pre-trained I3D model. These features are then passed to the transformer encoder. The encoder is a stack of L encoder layers. Each layer in the stack consists of two sublayers. In particular, the first layer is a self multi headed attention, which attends to all positions in the input sequence for every feature in the sequence. The second layer is the position wise fully connected network. Practically, it has two fully connected layers that are applied to every position in the input sequence. In the first layer of this fully connected network, the inputs are mapped to a higher dimension and squeezed back in the second layer. The position-wise network has the same set of weights when applied to each position. The encoder outputs a set of features where at each position a feature is attended to all other, other positions. The output of the encoder as well as the previous sequence of caption words are passed through the transformer decoder. Similar to the encoder, the decoder consists of L decoder layers. Opposed to the encoder, the decoder has an additional sublayer, namely encoder decoder attention. This sublayer is mostly similar to the self attention blocks where queries, keys, and values are the same. However, in the encoder decoder attention, the keys and values are taken from the encoder output. This encourages the decoder to attend not only to the previous sequence of caption words, but also to the sequence of input features. The other two sublayers are similar to the ones that are used in the encoder. Therefore, the decoder outputs the feature, which attends not only to the sequence of previous caption words, but also to all positions of the encoder output. 
Similar to the original architecture, we employ layer normalization and residual connection in each sublayer. Also, we add positional encoding vectors to the input features since the attention blocks are permutation invariant and have no sense of order within a sequence. In the case of other modalities, the feature embedding layer changes accordingly. More precisely, for audio modality, we employ the pre-trained vgg network, while for words from the speech modality, we train the text embedding similar to the ones which are used for the caption words. Since for the dense video captioning task, the events should be localized, we employ the predictions of the bidirectional single stream temporal action proposals network, as it's shown to achieve decent performance. In particular, BSST inputs a stack of C3D features. To account for the visual context, NLSTM makes a forward pass and encodes the video content from the past. During the forward pass, every position of the input sequence is treated as an ending point for a proposal. During the backward pass, NLSTM encodes the input features in a reversed order and regards the future positions as starting points of a proposal. At each position in forward and backward passes, it predicts confidences for each of the 128 anchors. The final set of proposals is obtained by multiplying confidence scores of every pair of anchors and selecting the best one out of them. We use ActivityNet captions for our experimentations. It is based on human activity recognition dataset called ActivityNet. ActivityNet caption contains 10,000 videos in the training set and 5,000 in the validation set. Each video in the validation set is annotated twice by different annotators. On average, each video is two minutes long and have four temporary localized captions. The average length of a caption is around 14 words. The dataset is distributed as a set of links to YouTube and pre-extracted C3D features. The C3D features are based on a visual sequence alone and therefore are not suitable for our experiments. As time passes, some of the YouTube videos become unavailable. Specifically, we managed to download only 91% of all videos from the dataset. To extract the speech segments, we use automatic speech recognition tool provided by YouTube. We compared the performance of our model to the set of baselines on the validation dataset of ActivityNet captions. We provide the performance on the full validation datasets, which might be unfair to our method as our model does not have any predictions for the missing videos and get zero scores on those. For a fair comparison, we also provide the results of our model on the videos where all three modalities are present. First, we compare our model on the capturing ground truth proposals. We observe that our model outperforms all listed methods on Blue 3 and 4, as well as Meteor. Furthermore, we compare our model with the others on the learned proposal setup. The table shows that our model performs competitively on Blue 3 and 4 metrics and outperforms all listed methods on Meteor. We highlight that our model achieves these results despite being trained on a smaller number of videos as they are no longer available for download. We run multiple ablation studies that consider different combinations of input modalities and fusion techniques. The reported results are evaluated against the full datasets without filtering it for missing data. We report the results in the following settings. The unimodal performance of audio and visual only models. The second setting is when the predictions of visual and audio only models are averaged. We observe that a simple averaging of predictions give a marginal improvement over the visual only model. The third setting is when the model's outputs are first concatenated and then two fully connected layers are used. In this case, we found that the performance improved significantly. Not that the number of parameters have also increased. To test if this improvement was due to additional modality or the increase in the number of parameters, we additionally report the performance of visual on the model, which has a similar number of parameters as the audio visual model. We observe that the performance remains on the same level as the visual on the model. Finally, we report the performance of the final model, which utilizes all three modalities as a reference. To test if our model improves the performance in general, rather than in a specific video category, we additionally retrieve a category of each video from YouTube. The number of videos within each category is shown in brackets. 
The categories in which the number of videos is too small are removed from the analysis. We compare the performance of our model in three different settings, audio only, visual only, and when all three modalities are used in the model. The results imply a consistent gain within each category except for categories film and animation and travel and events. This might be explained by the lack of correspondence between visual and audio tracks. Specifically, a video from travel and events category might be accompanied by music. For example, a promotion of a resort. Also, film and animation category contains cartoon-like movies that might have a realistic soundtrack while the visual track can be goofy. Now we show the qualitative results. Please note that the subtitles are not the part of the visual content and other just for demonstration purposes. Snowboarding for young kids, especially the under sixes, has become very accessible in recent years. The predictions of the visual only model incorrectly imply that the speaker is a man, while the prediction of the model, which considers the audio modality, guesses it correctly. Now let's watch another part of the video. Teaching little kids is super fun, with learning hidden in games and no direct technical teaching at all. Keeping things moving on, interesting and fun is what it's all about. Modern kids' snowboard equipment has come on leaps and bounds, with soft flexi boards, comfy boots and simple one-strap bindings. These little things make all the difference. Freestyle skills can be introduced very early on. Our model predicts that a woman is speaking to the camera while the visual sequence doesn't contain it. We might understand why the model makes this mistake. If we take a look at the predictions of the audio-only model, we will notice that this signal comes from the audio modality. In our implementation, the vocabulary size of caption words is approximately 10,000 words, and for speech segments it is 23,000. The features for audio and visual modalities are pre-extracted before training. The feature transformers have the following dimensions 512 for speech, 128 for audio, and 1024 for visual modality. This corresponds to the dimensions of the respective input features. Similar to the original transformer architecture, we employ the attention with multiple heads. We found that four heads perform optimally in our experiments. Our final model has one encoder and decoder layer. All three feature transformers are trained jointly using the KL divergence loss with the label smoothing. Adam optimizer was used with a constant learning rate. To regularize our model, we employ a mild dropout. The hyperparameters were manually tuned using Meteor metric on the validation set. The training batch size is 28 video clips. In total, our model has approximately 179 million parameters and trained for 30 epochs on one consumer type GPU for approximately 15 hours. In this work, we proposed a multimodal dense video capturing module and showed how dense video capturing might benefit from other modalities, namely audio and speech. The code for PyTorch implementation of the model and the project page is publicly available. Also check out our personal web pages to see the latest work on the topic. Feel free to contact us if you have any questions. Hello everyone, thank you for watching this presentation. My name is Thomas Theodoridis and together with my colleague Theoharis Hadzis, we are going to present to you our work titled Cross-Modal Variational Alignment of Flattened Spaces. First, we are going to present the motivation for our work, then provide a detailed description of the proposed method, then present the experimental evaluation of our framework in two different application domains, namely ingredient recognition and hand pose estimation. Finally, we are going to end with conclusions. Given two data modalities, M1 and M2, our goal is to find an effective approach in order to transition from M1 to M2. Traditional encoder-decoder architectures encode an input sample from M1 into a fixed point in latent space which is then decoded into the other modality, M2. 
variational encoder decoder architectures encode an interval sample from modality 1 into a probability distribution, and the sample from this distribution is decoded into modality M2. Ideally, to achieve the highest performance, information extracted from both modalities should be used for transitioning into modality M2, but in such a way as to require only modality M1 during evaluation. Although there are a number of such variational architectures, the proposed method addresses some of their shortcomings by employing three variational branches in order to combine the extracted information from both modalities. The upper branch of the architecture transitions from modality 1 to modality 2, therefore learning a mapping of M1 into a distribution in a way that is aligned to the final goal. The lower branch is a variational autoencoder, thus learning to project into a distribution in a way that favors reconstruction. The variational alignment branch in the middle, in order to effectively combine the information extracted by the other two branches, learns to align the distribution produced by encoder 1 and 2 in accordance with a target goal, therefore acting as a translation mechanism between the two. The training process for the architecture consists of two distinct phases. During the first one, the upper and lower branches are trained in parallel, independently of each other. During the second phase, only the variational alignment branch is trained, while both previous branches remain frozen. To this end, Encoder 1 encodes data samples from modality 1, producing vectors Mi1 and Sigma1. These vectors constitute the input to the mapper, which essentially performs a reparametrization of the distribution produced by encoder 1 through a mapping to an intermediate distribution. The distribution parameterized by the mapper generated Mi M and Sigma M is then used in order to draw a sample Z, which becomes the input to the decoder of the lower branch, decoder 2. The following figure provides visual evidence for the effectiveness of the proposed variational alignment branch. Using TSNE to visualize recipe projections from the three branches of the architecture, we see that image projections through the mapper are much closer to ingredient projections, while image projections from the upper branch are almost exclusively located to the right of the image. The proposed framework was evaluated in two different application domains food image analysis, and specifically on the task of ingredient recognition from a single image, in 3D hand pose estimation, and more specifically on estimating 3D hand pose configurations from RGB images. Regarding the experimental evaluation on ingredient recognition, the proposed framework was evaluated on two publicly available datasets, YAMLI 28K and Recipe 1 million. YAMLI 28K was used for evaluating the performance of the proposed method against other variational frameworks. In Recipe 1 million, the proposed method was evaluated against current state-of-the-art approaches in ingredient recognition. These are two example recipes from YAMLI 28K and Recipe 1 million. On top we see the recipe image and on the bottom the corresponding ingredients. Regarding data pre-processing, in YAMLI 28K, all images were resized to 360 by 240, while in Recipe 1 million, images were resized to 256 in their sorted side. Random crops of 224 by 224 were used during training, while the central crop of 224 by 224 was used during testing for both datasets. Regarding data augmentation, images were horizontally flipped with probability 0.5 randomly rotated by plus minus 10 degrees. During testing, no data augmentation was performed unless indicated by TTA next to the method name. Regarding the framework components, the image encoder is a DenseNet 121 model 
with two additional convolutional and average pooling layers before the fully connected layer and is also pre-trained on ImageNet. All other network components are single layer, fully connected networks. The dimensionality of all Latin probability distributions was set to 512. For comparison purposes on Gamli 28K, we have implemented two other cross-modal variational frameworks, CMVI based on SPUR 2018 and CADAVI based on Sonfeld 2019. Performance was measured using the F1 and the intersection over union metrics applied to the list of ground truth and predicted ingredients. In YAMLE 28K, we computed per recipe F1 and IOU metrics and averaged the results at the end. In recipe 1 million, they were computed using the code provided by Salvador 2019. Regarding the experimental results on GAMLE 28K, we can see that CMY achieved an F1 score of 39.8 and an IOU of 26.35. CADAVI, which employs an explicit distribution alignment objective, was able to improve upon these results by 0.95 in F1 and by 0.8 in IOU. The next two approaches in the middle section of the table are augmented versions of the CMVI and CADAVI architectures with our proposed mapper component. As you can see, they were able to improve upon their baselines in both cases. More specifically, CMVI plus our proposed mapper was 0.77 and 0.65 ahead in terms of F1 and IOU compared to its baseline, while CADAVI plus our mapper component improved the results by 0.25 in F1 and by 0.3 in IOU metrics. Finally, the proposed approach was able to outperform CMVI by 5.79 in F1 and by 5.26 in IOU, and CADAVI by 4.84 in F1 and 4.46 in IOU. Employing test time augmentation provided an increase of 1.64 and 1.36 in F1 and IOU metrics respectively compared to the baseline. Regarding the recipe 1 million experimental results, the proposed method outperformed the retrieval based approaches by more than 16 points in terms of F1. Compared to the feedforward approach, which has the same classifier as our method, it was ahead by 3.24 F1 and by 2.79 IOU points. The proposed method managed to outperform even the TF approach with a transformer-based classifier by 0.57 and by 0.5 in terms of F1 and IOU metrics. Test time augmentation provided further improvements, widening the difference to the transformer-based network to 1.44 and 1.27 points in terms of the F1 and IOU metrics. Regarding the task of 3D hand pose estimation, our method was evaluated on two publicly available datasets render hand pose dataset and stereo hand pose tracking benchmark. In order to evaluate the performance of our proposed framework, we used the two most common metrics on hand pose estimation field, mean end point error and area under the curve on the percentage of correct key points. RHD is a synthetic dataset containing rendered HUD images from 20 characters performing 39 actions. It consists of about 41,000 images for training and 3,000 images for evaluation with 320 by 320 resolution. For each sample, both 3D and 2D hand pose as well as depth map and segmentation masks are provided. This dataset is considered to be highly challenging as it contains heavily occluded fingers, visual diversity and noise. STB includes 12 sequences with 6 different backgrounds of figure counting and random poses. Each of these sequences consists of 1500 frames with a resolution of 640 
by 480, resulting in 18,000 samples in total. 3D keypoint annotations are provided and consequently a camera and intrinsic matrix can be utilized to obtain 2D keypoint locations. Concerning data preprocessing, we utilize 2D annotations in both datasets to create a bounding box around the hand region. Afterwards, we randomly rotate it in the range minus 45 degrees to 45 degrees, apply the random vertical flip with P equals 0.5 and resize the image to 256 by 256. A test time no data augmentation was conducted. In addition, hardness, palm center and scale of the hand were provided during both training and testing. Importantly, self-occlusion of the hand results in different observations for the same pose. For that reason, we moved the center of the hand to the center of the body box and accordingly rotated the 3D pose. Thus, the one-to-many mapping for the image pose pairs was alleviated. Resident 18 was employed as encoder 1 to encode RGB images. We adjusted the last fully connected layer such as to predict the mean and variance of a normal distribution for a given sample. As far as 3D hand pose encoder E2 and decoders D1 and D2 are concerned, we used 6 fully connected layers with 512 units per layer, while each of the mapper components consists of a single fully connected layer. Initially, we used the mean endpoint error metric to compare our method with other RGB to 3D methods. The experimental results of this comparison are presented in this table. As we can see, the proposed method that performed all other previous works, providing 15.61 and 6.93 mean endpoint error on RHD and STB datasets respectively. More specifically, the proposed cross-modal variational alignment approach achieves improvements up to 4.12 and 4.34 mean endpoint error in RHD and 1.63 and 1.73 mean endpoint error in STB from the cross-modal deep variational autoencoder and the disentangled variational autoencoder. Moreover, we compare the percentage of rendering of human meshes is difficult uh, in, in simulation. Um, having said that, we do have some efforts uh, in, in that direction. So, Manolo Sava uh, and Hanjo uh, do activity uh, research, they're both studying this problem. Uh, and I would say it's still in the realm of research, but, but we hope to report something on that uh, in, I would say, six to ten months. Uh, on the second direction of human data collection, uh, I think that one is much more manageable. Uh, it requires running habitat in a browser, which we have already built that capability, so we can connect it to a mechanical computer, so that humans can uh, almost treat this, uh, drive this robot in simulation, and you can have uh, data collection by asking people these questions. Uh, that is uh, much more manageable, and I think we can, we can get that. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Here's the time. We have to stop, uh, yeah, unfortunately. I want to thank you again. It's a very inspiring talk. I hope um, others can, can contact you if you have some questions. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you Michael, and thank you for the best of all Thanks. Okay, we'll shift to the next one. Yes, so we're going to uh, continue with the orals. Uh, the first talk is titled Exploring Phrase Grounding Without Training, Contextualization and Extension. Hello to everyone who found their virtual way to this presentation video. I am Letitia Perkelebescu, a PhD student in Heidelberg University, and I will present my research conducted with my supervisor, Professor Annette Frank, about phrase grounding without any training, but employing a structured visual representation and knowledge injection to find out how well our approach without any training works on both phrase grounding and image retrieval. Stay until the end of our video and or read our paper. First, I will create a common ground for everyone, explaining what phrase grounding is. The task is to deliver a bounding box B in an image I that circumscribes the location of the area a phrase P is referring to. In this example, we see the localized stairs, the child, and so on. Secondly, for text-based image retrieval, we have the following setup. We have a caption and the system must rank 1000 images based on how well they correspond to that caption. Now that we have defined the two tasks of our paper, let us motivate what our paper is about. 
When people are performing phrase grounding, they usually train a strongly supervised system on a large amount of data that contains sentences with highlighted phrases, annotated with the bounding box corresponding to a certain area in the image where said phrase is localized. Other approaches fall into the weak supervised category. They try to solve the phrase grounding task implicitly by strongly supervising the system on sentence image retrieval, for example. This is intuitively expected to work, because the system computing correspondences between image and text is expected to also understand correspondences between image regions and spans of text. These two approaches have been extensively used over the last years. But our research question was, is there a way to do phrase grounding without any annotation containing paired examples of phrases and bounding boxes on images? without any training or supervision. So now if we do not use any of the modern luxury of deep learning, what do we want to use instead? We want to profit from what deep learning has already given us. Out of the box scene graph generators. So what exactly is a scene graph generator? It detects objects and delivers their bounding box with a label, like an object detector does. On top of this, it detects also relations between objects and labels them, for example, child on stairs. We also want to use external knowledge and the linguistic structure of this knowledge, as for example given in a linguistic ontology, to be better informed in cases where language uses for example baby to refer to the girl in the picture. Because we are not using any training or learning procedure for our model, but compared to deep learning models, our approach can be considered a baseline or a test for the performance of deep neural models. And sadly, we were not exactly the only ones to think about a going non-annotated way, as there has been one single other approach trying to do this, as we see now in the related work. I will skip the related work in the strongly and weakly supervised realm because the proposed approaches are numerous. Relevant for comparison to our work is that the majority rely on region proposal backbones, like the ones we find in faster RCNN, but fine-tune the visual features for the task. So we go straight to the unsupervised setting, where there has been one approach for phrase grounding without training, where they select phrase object pairs based on their word and label embedding similarity. However, they treat object detection as an unstructured bag of objects. They also use different object detectors, one color detector, and their object detector upper bound is only 50%. Although the image retrieval task is close to the semi-supervised setting for phrase grounding, there is no prior work on unsupervised methods for this task. Does this mean it is impossible? We try it out. Phrase grounding is a multimodal task, per definition. When we talk about a visual domain, we can obtain structure with a scene graph. The problem with the scene graph generator or object detectors is that they do not possess the extensive vocabulary like the caption or the phrases do on the language side. If we search, for example, for uniforms, we will not find it in the scene graph. Furthermore, in an unstructured scenario, all the woman detections would be undistinguishable without training and the items would have no connection between each other. But with context, we are not only able to disambiguate the women, we also map uniform closer to the items because of their same relationship, wears, and the same parent label, woman. On the linguistic side, we can also employ the graph structure of a linguistic knowledge base like WordNet, for example, where we can obtain additional information. For example, when trying to find the phrase uniform in the picture, it is very useful to know that a uniform is a kind of clothing which is in turn a kind of skirt. So how do we integrate all this in a method using no phrase grounding annotations? So for a given image with no annotation whatsoever, we have a query phrase here marked in red. And this query phrase we embed into the word of X space. Next, we move to the image representation, where we let an out-of-the-box scene graph generator generate this scene graph. Of course, these labels of this graph come with bounding boxes. And we can embed these labels into the word to vec space or the word vector space of our liking. Next, we also want to inform our graph nodes about the knowledge present in a linguistic knowledge base like WordNet and embed these too. And now that we have our representations, we are ready to compute for each node listed here a rank or a similarity to the phrase. 
We use two measures for this, the cosine similarity and the path similarity in the WordNet graph. For the first one, the cosine similarity, we just compute the word vector similarity between the embedding of the phrase and the embedding of the labels. On this basis, the word kid is ranked highest and we would select it as our phrase grounding candidate, only that this is a knowledge node. In order to retrieve a bounding box for it, we go backwards in the graph and select the bounding box of child because child is the parent of kid. Because the cosine similarity has drawbacks, like for example where antonyms are matched closely together. Since the word embeddings capture co-occurrences, we can also use a measure that takes into account the structural information in a rare source like WordNet. Such a measure is the path similarity, which is defined by the formula here. So this is inversely proportional to d, where d is the shortest path between the sense of the query phrase in the WordNet graph and the label from the image or knowledge representation here above. So we have two measures, which we can either combine through this formula or compute separately. What kinds of linguistic knowledge bases we can use? There is WordNet and we use it in some of our experiments, but there is also others we can use, like the label hierarchy of the Open Images dataset. Zooming into this hierarchy, we see how it captures hypernymy-hyponymy relationships that can help us overcome the small vocabulary of scene graphs or the problem of object detectors failing to understand that a woman is also a person. With our model in place, we are ready to evaluate it on the Flickr 30k entities dataset. We report the classical accuracy, meaning that a bounding box ranked first by our method has an intersection over union greater than 0.5 with the ground truth. The third column shows the upper bound, which basically answers the question how many of the query phrases even have a bounding box in the candidate set of object proposals. We compare to the only method doing phrase grounding without training mentioned in the related work. We present their best result, which is a combination of three object detectors and using only their best performing single object detector called Tfoid. We re-implement their approach for comparability as a baseline. So here Tfoid is the same system, a faster CNN trained on open images and produces a bag of object detections, among which we rank by cosine similarity. By adding here the scene graph structure on top of these detections, we see a small improvement. The actual improvement is hidden in the statistics of the data. For more details, check our paper. We see in Magenta how the scene graph structure and the relatedness between the hat and the head help to localize the red hat query. We also see an improvement when injecting the label hierarchy of open images into our structured visual representation. As an example, the additional information that a person is wearing a clothing piece helps us detect the light blue jacket. Otherwise, the choice of the system not informed by the hierarchy would have chosen a bicycle helmet. By computing the similarities between labels and phrase not only by cosine similarity but by a combination of the word net path similarity and the cosine similarity, we are able to map a person closer to several climbers in this example. If we would have used only the cosine similarity, we would have associated footwear with climbers. Our best score with this object detector backbone is achieved by combining the scene graph information with the path similarity. By now, we focused on measuring our improvement over the prior work baseline using only their Tfoid object detector. But in general, we are not restricted to an object detector with such a low upper bound. So we instead employ VisGen, a faster RCNN-based object detector trained on visual genome that has a considerably higher upper bound. And also this upper bound is more realistic because it is closer to what weekly supervised methods use. And here we see that with VisGen our results improve considerably and outperform not only weekly supervised systems but also many supervised methods. So far we have discussed our experiments on phrase grounding. Now, remembering the weekly supervised systems that implicitly learned to ground while doing sentence image retrieval, we now ask, can we adapt our method just a little bit to see if unsupervised methods can compete with supervised ones? And also see if structural information is helpful here? Let's see. But first, how do we perform sentence to image retrieval? Given a query caption and our 1000 candidate images, we perform phrase grounding between the image and noun phrase and aggregate the phrase grounding scores and select the highest one from the thousand images. 
We perform sentence to image retrieval again on Flickr 30k. Here we show recall at k and median rank. For median rank, lower is better. We see that supervised systems have gone really far lately. We observe that while employing only the object detector of Wang and Specia for unsupervised retrieval, the result is not so impressive. But with VisGen and using visual and linguistic structure, our completely unsupervised system can really compare to supervised neural computer visions of 2015. To conclude, we have shown that structured representations of images and injection of linguistic knowledge are beneficial in a system that requires no training nor loss function to guide the attention to relevant input regions. We put our unsupervised method on a stress test on image retrieval that did not meet the highest expectations but proves that supervision is not the only way to go. The alarm we set with our work is however that this blind, untrained model not looking at a picture but through the looking glass of scene graphs and knowledge bases can perform competitively with supervised and weakly supervised methods. So, I thank you for being a patient audience until the end and leave you with the following question. Quo vadis multimodal learning? Can we study unsupervised methods for tasks we always consider suitable only for supervised systems? Can more structure in visual and language help us to make such systems truly competitive also in the world of visual transformers? What do you think? Thanks for your attention to our work. In the emotion recognition problem, the visual model data are usually much more annotated than the audio model data. Many cognitive psychology studies evidence the correlation of a person's facial expression and the emotional state content in their voice. Uh, what's why a research question is, can we facilitate the audio emotion recognition with facial expression data? In fact, we can say in many real-world problems, it is very common that we have limited labeled training data and much more unlabeled data in the tech domain, while in the meantime, we have abundant labeled data in a related domain. This work deals with this semi-supervised learning scenario where we adapt data from other domain to our task. In our work, the new target domain examples are generated in a cross-model translation process. Like the red area suggests, the facial example in the source domain are translated to the audio example in the target domain. But we split all the generations based on their probability density in the feature space. Those high density examples are fit for the data augmentation purpose in order to provide more labeled data in the target domain. The translation unit uses two coupled VAE GANs. The two sets of autoencoders share the latent space, which implies cycle consistency. Then each decoder is fully supervised by a discriminator. One discriminator is joint parameterized with the task classifier we can. The low density portion of the generated examples are used in the adversarial training of the translation process. The discriminator has to learn to classify the low density data as a fake class along with the target classes. The training objective states a discriminator should classify the data points sampled from the generator as fake data. And it should classify all the labeled data to the correct class labels and classify any unlabeled data as any class of the real classes but not the fake class. The generated data points of a different density have different effects to the landed classification decision boundaries. The merits of using the low density examples as the fake data instead of the high density portion is that the landed true or fake decision boundary limits the freedom of the real class decision boundaries that we really care. The two figures are a toy example about what happens when the discriminator learns to recognize the low density example as the fake data. In the left figure, it shows data points belongs to four classes. The color means the class. The cross is the labeled points. And the clouds refers to the much, much more unlabeled data. In the red figure, it shows the decision boundary when the training converges with the above training objective. 
Here again, colors denotes the areas of that each class belongs to. But we also have this white curve. It is the true or fake decision boundaries. You may notice that there are vaguely four enclosed areas by white, corresponding to the four clouds in the left figures. You could also notice the four enclosed areas are slightly larger than the area of the clouds. This is because the generated low density samples are surrounding the high density clusterings. That's surrounding here. As a result, the low density samples can encourage the discriminator to place the uh, real class class decision boundaries into the low density areas. Visually speaking, the decision boundary of each class is encouraged to stay away from uh, the true fake decision boundaries. You see, those borderlines for the changing color is the real class decision boundaries. The translation process assumes each domain has an autoencoder that encodes an example into a latent vector. It also assumes that the latent space can be shared by both domains such that the two analogous examples are mapped to the same latent code. The density estimation is realized in this translation process via important sampling. The latent vector of the generated target example will be sampled according to the, its encoder for n times. Then with the fully probabilistic decoder, we can estimate the target example density. In the practice, we use more efficient sampling technique, but it is based on the same idea. Combined with all the real examples and the high density portion of the generated data points, we construct a graph representation of all the data points and propose a regularizer to reduce the overall smoothness of the graph by tuning the feature extractor. When we obtain a smooth graph, we allow the labels of the labeled data points propagate through its connection in the graph. The construction of the graph representation requires setting a parameter epsilon. When two data points L2 norm of their feature vectors is less than this epsilon, the two data points are considered as connected by a weighted edge in the graph. The weight of each edge is also based on their nodes' feature vectors. We use a Gaussian radial basis function to calculate it. From the, the definition of the smoothness term, you can see that we encourage similar points to share a same label. The smoothness regularizer is differentiable and can be trained end to end. So, as a summary, our framework is consists of three data augmentation techniques. At first, the cross-domain translation provides two kinds of data augmentations. We use the high-density translation as the supplements to the limited labeled data in the target domain, where the low-density examples are viewed as the fake data in a generative adversarial setting. The, the label propagation is an other source uh, for the new neighbor data. In the ablation study, we examined the effectiveness of each technique and its combination with the audio emotion recognition task. Here is the data set used in this study. We have two multimodality emotion data sets, this rave and this cree. They consist of uh, facial and vocal emotional expressions in sentences spoken in a range of uh, basic emotional states. The problem is the scale of uh, the annotated audio modality can poorly support the training of uh, emotion recognition with audio information. In the table, the base shows the accuracy we achieved when we trained with those audio modality examples only. We augment the audio modality examples from multiple image dataset for facial expression recognition, as well as the visual modality of uh, Cree and uh, Rave. 
the rest of the table shows the improvements when we add each augmentation techniques. The high density generations are convincingly useful. We test our method as a general purpose semi supervised domain adaptation solution on a recent benchmark dataset for large scale domain adaptation. We chose four domains from the domain net. We construct seven translation scenarios. For example, here R to the C means the target domain is the clip art. We limit the number of uh, the labeled examples in the clip art and we augment the clip art domain from the data in the real domain. In the benchmark study, we compare our work to other few short learning methods and report the average accuracy of the seven transfer scenarios when changing the number of uh, the available labeled examples in the target domain. As the number of uh, target examples increase, our method tends to perform better than the other methods. Hello everyone, I'm Bo Fan Xu from University of California, Berkeley. Today, I'm going to present a new dataset for multimodality learning called Social Vision and Language Dataset, acronym SVLD. First, our motivation. Given both vision and language can convey social information, we would like to use both modalities to model these complex social distributions. To achieve this multimodality social learning goal, we need a relevant dataset that contains both vision and language data within the same social context. Here is a table that compares our dataset with some selected datasets. From this, we can observe several issues that other datasets have. They have limited number of modalities, usually comprised of images or videos, along with their captions or class names. They have limited uh, modality complexity. For vision datasets, this means clear-cut objects with literal classes for classification, segmentation, and captioning. For language datasets, this means well-defined Q&A or, uh, or object or action descriptions. They have limited number of data, that have information spans across multiple modalities. And finally, there are limited social contexts associated with object or action in vision datasets, or Q&A and object or action descriptions in language datasets. With that, I will go into detail with our SVLD dataset. Here is a sample data. We scraped the dataset from imager.com, a social media website. Each data element consists of a post and multiple comment trees. The post contains a title, multiple images and or videos, optional descriptions under each image or video, and various other paired social information, such as tags, number of views, and post date. For optional descriptions, they sometimes serve as a caption to a single image or video, but more often, they often, uh, they often tell a story regarding to that image or video or the entire post. For tags, they can be either literal or abstract. The style of the post spans from well-defined objects and actions to abstract themes. Images and videos can be natural or man-made, such as cartoons, movies, or web pages. The post also contains many comment trees where user comments form tree-like structures. Each comment can be text, and or image or video, making commentaries multimodal themselves. In addition, each comment has a point determined by the user community, which is an unambiguous metric evaluating how popular the comment is in the community. There are three styles for the commentaries. Shallow tree with lots of branches, which happen during opinion sharing. A deep tree with limited branches, which happens in Q&A, and a mixture of both which happens in general discussion. For the purpose of this presentation, we omitted extra images and videos in the post, along with a vast number of commentaries. But in reality, there can be multiple images and videos in a single post, along with many commentaries. These two tables show the general statistics about our dataset. With a total of 603K posts, 2.6 million post images, 
433k post videos, 1.2 million comment images, 4 million comment videos, and 85.4 million comments. Our dataset is one of the first multimodal dataset that contains both vision and language data, along with parasocial information at this scale. Here are the distributions for date and number of views. On top is the data distribution across time. With data spanning across six years, we have the ability to work with non-stationary social distributions and answer questions about the shifting social themes and how the paired vision and language distribution can evolve over time. In addition, multiple peaks in the distribution for a number of views on the bottom suggest a complex non-Gaussian distribution that more faithfully reflects real-world social data. We also provide some modality-specific statistics where the perplexity given is empirical three-gram perplexity. The high unique word sizes and perplexities compare with a dataset such as MSRVTT, something something, and MSCOCO suggest that this is a more faithful render rendering of in-the-wild data, which real-world understanding systems will encounter. There are many possible venues of research. With all the modalities in our dataset, we can have a matrix of cross-modality prediction ex experiments, ranging from well-studied tasks in social contexts, such as predicting the number of upvotes, number of views, or tags, to far more challenging tasks, such as selecting and or predicting most popular image, video, or comments. These data will also provide a playground where more advanced models can be experimented in order to fuse information across multiple modalities. It is an open research question on how to effectively extract information from a tree of natural languages that extends beyond simple Q&A, not to mention how to learn from a forest of common trees with different sizes that contain images, videos, and text. Similarly, Instead of using single image and single video, we can use sets of images and videos in a post to jointly train a model that predicts social information, such as tags or number of views, or a model that determines why users select to post different images and videos within a same single post. With paired timestamp on each data element, we can observe and try to predict on a macroscopic level how social theme shifts through time. Last but not least, with paired, social, with paired data across multiple modalities, it is possible to train models that uncover factors that affect the social relevance of the post. This model, in turn, can help with the development of tools designed to produce relevant content or perform content moderation at a large scale. Here is an illustration of our model's concept. The key idea is that multiple encoders from different modalities provide input for a multimodal encoder, who provides embedding input for each of the decoder models. Due to the time constraints at publication, only encoders and decoders in bold color are experimented. We believe the ones in faint color will serve as interesting inputs and outputs. And in reality, the options for encoders and decoders can extend beyond what we propose in this figure. These are the results.